And we kick off with Standard Bank. The company announced a market-beating performance, registering a growth in first-half earnings of around 11% to 6.6 billion rand and headline earnings of 418,4 cents, an increase of around 10% despite low client activity across all its key markets. The bank, however, reported a flat, flat dividend for the period, remaining at 141 cents per share. Standard Bank market cap, 143 billion, big of the big four. Price earnings at 12, dividend yield 4.3. Baron, next come to you first. And I want to hone straight in on the costs. Um, the numbers broadly not bad. Some some stuff we can drill into. Cost to income ratio 58.4 for the first six months. First six months of last year 58.1. After the retrenchments in the second half, I thought that would have gone backwards. Uh, Laney was interviewing uh, the CEO on, on, on Closing Bell, and he was saying he doesn't think it's going to get back into the back to the 50, which was historically there. So two parts to it. One, high number and not going back to where we saw it in the heydays of sort of 05, 06, 07. I actually watched that interview. Um, he did mention that last year, I think it was above 60. Yeah, it did um, come in for so the full year, 61.7. So it is coming down, and we know it's a, it's a general theme, especially in, in, in <coughs> growing economies, that uh, costs are increasing. Um, he also mentioned that they're putting a lot of capital expender into, into expanding in Africa. So, um, you know, if a company is doing that and, uh, you know, putting that capital expenditure into expanding and that's increasing costs, I'll be happy because the returns will come later. I was, I was very impressed with the results. Um, you know, 11% gr growth in uh, a world that's supposed to be, you know, ending. Um, <laughs> I, 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 was, I was very impressed. But interestingly, I actually spoke to a client today who owns a small business and um, he he was in the process of purchasing another business. And he said he struggled to get a loan uh, from any of the big four banks. And he had a you know, perfect credit rating and no gearing. So it's interesting to see what it's like on the ground floor and how you know, these banks are actually reacting to sentiment at the moment. Well, it's quite fascinating because one, one thing I did interrogate him on was Africa and Africa's strategies. And we know that in, with regards to US dollar terms, we know that uh, earnings were relatively flat on the, the rest of the continent, ex-South Africa. But he did allude to once they are a fully fledged bank, in other words, incorporating retail and corporate as well, then, then profitability will change quite extensively. But he didn't want to commit to a target range. And of course, as you said, you, you listen to the interview. What is your sense in terms of prospects for the African continent? Because that is going to be their big fo focus going forward. Well, I mean, with any business, you know, it's going to take a while to, to start actually reaping the rewards of your initial capital investments. Um, they're going to have to find their feet there and, uh, you know, build themselves and build their brand. Um, I, I think, you know, obviously everyone talks about Africa coming off a low base, which is fantastic. And in the reports, in the earnings reports, I, I read that uh, it was quite interesting to see that um, African markets, stable markets and growing markets had actually pulled through nicely this year, whereas, you know, sentiment in Europe and, and, and things on that side were, were hampering, you know, future growth. So it was great to see, you know, the, the developing countries, you know, pulling through and showing, um, you know, the shift. I want to throw to, to, to Jonathan, let's get a, a perspective from the, the, the charts there. Uh, Jonathan, as soon as that chart comes up on the wall, I mean, what, what we are patently seeing is from, what's it, Q1 2010, uh, we were up at uh, 117 or so. We've got a channel trending down, and I'm imagining, I'm mean, suspecting that big red line is your moving average. It's a 200-day again. Not the bullish, most bullish chart in the world. No, not at all, Simon. And, uh, you know, this whole trend has changed uh, somewhat uh, since quarter two of 2010. Um, obviously, with the last uh, week's action, the acceleration down to the bottom of the channel. But what is interesting to note over here is the full extent of the rally since the March 2009 low, uh, all the way up to the quarter 110. Um, if that represents 100% of the rally, these dotted lines that I have over here are called Fibonacci retracements. Um, and they, they're, very, they're very important levels that one needs to look at because uh, markets tend to retrace somewhat during the course of their, their, their up runs and on their down runs. Um, so when we have a look at this full trend, our first retracement level is at 32.8% retracement level, which came down to around the 96 Rand level, which we saw the prices holding that between the quarter one of 2011 and where we are today, just the, the, the beginning of the week, which, which broke that through that level. Now, that, that week that broke through that level down to the 90 Rand level was an important, very, very important break. We can see again the second uh, Fibonacci retracement level, 
at that 50% level. Now the 50% level represents basically the floor of the market and it's an, an important, an important uh, level because if prices can hold above that 50% level, we could see the start moving back up again but I'm not, uh, I'm not yeah. very bullish on the stock uh, for, for the next... Uh, Jonathan, what is the smart money doing? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think uh, it's very clear and obvious that the smart money is actually leaving the stock. Um, very difficult. I have not plotted the volume, but we can see that the investors are moving out of the stock. Uh, it's been a slow dwindling of prices, and I don't think that, uh, that this is over. We might get a short respite in rallies, but I don't think we're going to get much above that 100 Rand level again. Uh, Byron, to bring it back to you and to, to crunch the numbers, uh, credit loss ratio 0 0.8 versus 1.04 in the last period. But critically, uh, Nedbank and ABSA, who've both brought out results recently, both still above that 1% level. Certainly, they, they, they're the right, right side of 1%. Of they're getting a handle on it. But to your comment, not, not lending aggressively, but the bad debt's certainly getting into that right place. And they must be pretty much at that 0 0.8, getting close to their long-term trend lines. And that's probably why. I mean, everyone got a huge scare in 08, uh, in 08 when uh, you know things were happy and uh, everyone was lending uh, for free. But um, uh, obviously, you know, th those are the effects uh, that we can see coming through, and it's fantastic that they have been able to do that. Um, I think they should start uh, lending a bit more. Obviously, everyone would want them to because uh, you know that's going to increase global um, economic activity. We, we, we're seeing it in home loans. I mean, home loans are getting quite aggressive. They, they, they say that they're, they're now number one. They still home loans are still the hard part in terms of, of, of the credit impairments. We see that across all the banks, eight percent at over ninety days. But that, uh, a bit of activity in credit card. But you're right. There's there's not that flow of money back to the consumer. Is it banks not lending? Is it consumers not asking? or is it a combination of both really hitting? I think it's more banks not lending. Um, I have a feeling that uh, a lot is coming from top in terms of uh, the regulations. I know we have Basel III and the capital requirements, but um, there's a lot more that comes with that, with, with those requirements. And um, I, I think, uh, you know, in going into the future, banks are going to be regulated more and more because of what happened in 08. No one wants that to happen again. So, you know, I mean, they obviously have a very important role to play, but um, in terms of uh, hold, being held back when, when time starts, you know, picking up, I think regulators have learned from, from their mistakes and they don't, wanna, they don't want uh, something like that to happen again. With regards to bank assurance and something that Simon pointed out to me a little earlier uh, today, it seems that Standard Bank is doing something right relative to its peers. Are you paying cognizance? Are you, are you looking and focusing on this and the fact that we're starting to see the synergies working quite well in an environment where it hasn't really worked that sophisticatingly well? Right. Yeah, we certainly we've seen space. the abscess and the net banks not doing much. Standard Bank, uh, well, Liberty gets 33% of new business from Standard Bank. Stanlib 20%. Mm. Yeah, the guys aren't really doing those sort of numbers. Standard Bank is really the only one really making bank mm. assurance work. And, and the Liberty results look fantastic. You know, they've really turned things around. But again, um, you know, they, they, they even said in their numbers, the economy has grown 4.7% 4 4 um, in the beginning of this year in, in South Africa. Um, so, you know, when things go well, uh, it's, hard to, it's hard to believe that after seeing the markets in the last few days. But with thing, when things are going well, the insurance companies really do do well. Yeah. Um, because, you know, what they do with their cash um, uh, that they get from the premiums mm -hmm. uh, has a lot to do with, uh, you know, how well they do. And obviously when assets are growing and the economy is doing well, they're almost a geared position to the, to the economy as a whole. Jonathan, I want to bring it back to you in your chart there. I mean, the one thing we're seeing is certainly today's strong bounce uh, uh, for, for Thursday, uh, Standard Bank came late to that party but did bounce a bit. 100 Rand seems to be quite likely in the card, certainly a convergence of that upper trend line, more or less the 200-day the moving average. But when we get to that 100 Rand, are we going to get the headwinds? We are. We're going we're gonna to run into the resistance. And I, I think the first level that we've got to be, we, we've got to be concerned about with the, with the uptick is up to around the 96 Rand level where, where initially it broke through that support. And if we can get past that 96 Rand level, we will see a test of that 100 Rand. But I can't see that uh, going much further than that. There is going to be a lot of sellers coming in at those levels. Jonathan, yeah, when I look at what investors have been talking about over the last couple of years, I know that they keep saying that Standard Bank is a steal below 100 Rand. 
Tell us about the thinking behind that when it comes to the technical gaps. Would you agree with that? Well, I mean, <coughs> what's cheap today might be cheaper tomorrow. So mm -hmm. whether it's a steel at 90 Rand, it must be an unbelievably steel at, at 80 Rand. So it really, uh, you know, it, it markets move up and down. So we can't just place a value below 100 Rand, there's great value in, in, a, in a stock. Just reiterate for us, what are the chances that it could actually go to the low that you were alluding to during the market crash? Of course, we know that Simon Brown is nibbling, but I mean, I don't think his nibbling will be able to support a share price like no, that, right? Yeah. No, not, not Standard Bank. <laughs> I think, Eleni, I think the question is uh, what it does at this 50% level. Uh, at this 50% level, if I had to quantify it to the actual price, it's around the 88 and a half Rand level. So if it manages to stay above there, then there's a good chance that it could come back and test the previous highs. Yep. But if it does break those levels, okay. then there's a better chance that the, the 2009 lows will be tested. Byron, bring it back to you. Dividend 1 round 41. Standard Bank didn't cut the dividend during the crisis. Kudos to them. That was nice, particularly as a shareholder. I've got to say, I really honestly was looking for an increase to keep the dividend flat surprised me absolutely no end. It was the first thing I went to when those numbers came out um, and I, I, I was expecting 15 or 20 percent and I get uh, another 141. Notwithstanding, div yield 4.3, mm. nice, but really I was looking That's for that to edge closer to 5. It's still a good yield and all the other banks are yield, yielding you know, fairly good dividends. But again, we go back to their capital spending and at this stage, you know, if they feel they can use the money better than uh, you can, then um, you know, I'm, happy, I'm happy to put that in their hands. Um, you know, we should be expecting quite a big capital injection from the, the sale in Russia and uh, the sale in Argentina. 750 million US dollars. Yes, yes, yeah. I saw that. And he said, but it's only going to come next year. Yeah. But um, I like the fact that they're getting out of those economies. You know, it's 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 quite tough to to operate in 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 in, in So you in like those the, the Africa focus I, I, rather I, I than the I prefer the African market. theme, and uh, and Jaco said that he said that he's going to you know start allocating that money into the capital expenditure through Africa. Hot or not for you, Byron? I like it, especially at these levels. Um, out of the big four, it's definitely the one I prefer. Um, I like the African expansion, I, li I like the African theme, and uh, if there was one bank out of the big four that I'd, I'd buy, I'd definitely be standard bank. Okay, but so you, at these levels, but would you buy? Hot. Are you going to buy? Personally. Vestac, <laughs> <laughs> personally? If a, if a client came and had, uh, you know I prefer African bank, but yes. if a client came and had African banks and was looking for more exposure and something different, Santa yeah. Bank would be the first one I'd go to. Fantastic. Okay, Jonathan. Short term, it might be a bit of a bounce uh, okay, up to that 96, but over the medium to long term, I don't like it. Not hot? Not hot. Simon, sorry, bad news for you, and I know you love technical analysis. I thought you would have been looking at these graphs. Before you long term, I, I distinguish, my, right? distinguish between long and short. Yes. And I bought my standard banks. And yes, I bought some on Monday. They are in the green. I, I, was, <laughs> I, I, I like the numbers. They didn't blow me away. Cost to income worries me. I would have liked a higher dividend. Um, look, I own a whole bunch. Everyone knows that. Um, yeah. I, I think around those sort of low 90s, I think they're, they're, they're worth jumping into. I'm with Byron. I think of the, of the big four, certainly the three we've seen, absent that bank, stand, yeah. uh, standard bank, this is my pick. Fantastic. Now, shifting gears, Goldfields reported that adjusted earnings per share totaled 184 cents in the second quarter, up 15 percent from the 160 cents it posted in the previous quarter. Goldfields quarterly net earnings increased 15 percent to 1.26 billion rand from 1.1 billion rand. The company benefited significantly from the rising gold price during the June quarter, managing to translate a 5 percent production increase into 15 percent earnings growth. Goldfields declared an interim dividend dividend of 100 cents per share. Goldfields market cap 81 billion plus earnings 18. We've finally seen that number coming down. Dividend yield 1.5. For a gold miner, I suppose that's quite exciting. I, uh, I mean, I'll say that for, you know, tongue in cheek, but in truth, mm -hmm. we're not typically used to seeing consistent dividend payments. Right? Could gold mines finally, perhaps, with gold where it is and the rand sort of around the seven, could we see some some continual dividend flows? Was it still going to be like the occasional bit of dividend here, bit of dividend there? Yeah, I don't sit in the in the gold bull camp, unfortunately. <laughs> so. Um, I, I, don't, I personally don't think so. Um, obviously, the South African producers and gold fields have a big, have a lot of South African assets, are almost facing a perfect storm. You know, they've got the gold price coming up. They've got the South African rand getting weaker, mm -hmm. but um, they're trading on you know extremely demanding multiples, and obviously they track the gold price and so on. But when are they really going to produce those earnings to meet the you know the, the current prices that they're trading? Like well, the platinum guys did in two thousand and six yeah. and seven. I don't see it coming, to be honest. Um, 
I'm a long term. But you've got to look further the... from South Africa, though. You've got to yes, see the yes, international definitely. operations. They've got exciting things happening in Peru, where we know that uh, cash costs are sitting at around $400 an ounce or so. We know that there could be a platinum project online uh, in the likes of Finland. We know that they're operating in Mali, in the Philippines. And the earnings mix interestingly enough, has now dropped to around uh, 43 to 47%, and international uh, earnings are starting to play more of a significant role. Is that not incentive enough for you to say, well, this company is doing something right? No, they're definitely doing something right, and their international diversification <coughs> has, has been fantastic, and it's benefiting them, you know, like you said. Um, I saw Nick Holland talking about the Ghanaian asset and how that's yeah. going to, you know, almost uh, fourfold in terms of production in the next few years or so. Um, so, you know, there's obviously good prospects there. But, you, you just know, don't like what they produce. I don't like what they produce. <laughs> you don't like and they're trading on a, trading on a, a, a PE of, of a, a technology stock. You know, they're not going to change the world with their gold. Um, they it's nothing exciting. The Jeez, the central banks and everyone else <laughs> seems to think so, at least for now. Yeah, well, Ben Bernanke doesn't. He says it's just tradition. <laughs> I, I want to throw to Jonathan on the wall. Uh, head and shoulders were an upside down, were inverse head and shoulders. Uh, very, very powerful chart pattern. Also gives us a great target if everything falls in line, which includes the volume. Talk us through the head and shoulders you see. Well, this there. is an inverse head and shoulders pattern which completely reverses the downtrend that Goldfields has been in since uh, December 2010. As you said, the volume is extremely <coughs> important. No matter how beautiful the picture looks and how picture perfect it is, if volume is not confirming this picture, then, then it's not a valid picture. But what, I re what really struck me when I did this analysis was how perfect the actual volume was um, um, confirming the actual picture. We can see the, the, the formation of the left shoulder is actually made by uh, decreasing volume. The rally on the upside increases as well. And as the price comes down to form the head, the volume starts to increase much, much more. Uh, the, the volume continues to accelerate on the way up to create the second rally and contracts noticeably around the contraction or the, or the formation of the right shoulder and then volume picks once again, one yeah. picks up again all the way through the neckline and once broken the, through the neckline we can then call this picture a valid picture which, uh, which we can then start looking at the at minimum targets. So in other words, smart money into, the, into stock. the stock. Absolutely and and looking, I mean, we, we, we've got a trend line there, not the neckline, but the trend line that's been broken, a 200-day moving over it's been broken, the, the right shoulder gives way, um, and, and, and I mean, looking at everything here, certainly a bullish picture, and 130 your target. 130 is the target, and the, way the, 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 the reason why I get to the 130 is just the, taking the depth of the actual pattern from the low of the head to mm -hmm. the actual neckline and transferring that on to the breakout point of which was yesterday at the 112, which takes us to around the 130 Rand level. Now again, it's not going to go there in one shoot. Basically the, the rule of thumb is however long it took to form the head and shoulders pattern yeah. will normally take how, uh, how far it will take to, uh, to hit the minimum target. So, so words, about four months. Yeah, so four if, months. You, if you want to get into the stock, you've still got around four months? we still got around, no. The four months, will be, we'll, we're looking at the target in around four months time. So we probably want to be looking at, the, at getting into the stock sooner rather than later. Do you like what the company produces, Jonathan? I love what the company produces. <laughs> <laughs> cool. He's a gold bull. So I didn't bother to ask him for a chart. He would make us a pretty picture. You mentioned the smart <laughs> Smart money is going in. Are you trying to say that uh, Byron and Simon are not being smart? I, I don't insinuate anything. <laughs> <laughs> that's what creates the market. <laughs> okay, so uh, Byron, again, let's just look at some of the, the underlying issues here. It was quite fascinating, and I posed this question to Nick Holland about the cash costs. And we know that we've seen quite a big increase in cash costs. And if you take out the electricity tariff, that has been uh, included within that cash cost, then um, earnings were quite flat. I did then ask him if he was going to work harder to bringing down the overall costs that they are facing. And it seems that they are on a path to do that. Do you think that it is a possibility in your mind? Yeah, I think that if they took away the electricity tariffs, costs were only up 1% compared yeah, so to 5%. Yeah, basically flat, exactly. Yeah, but um, I mean, that was also only for the for the quarter, am I right, or the half year? The half, the half year. So, I mean, you're only judging on a quarter, but if you look at the history, costs have been going up, um, you know, extensively. Um, and also, it's, it's not, with the gold companies, it's not just about the costs, it's also the production. It's because it's getting very, more and more difficult to mine. Goldfields have, have, have had this target of, uh, uh, a million ounces a quarter for, yeah. for so long now. They, and they're still sitting it. around 850,000. They still can't reach that target. For the and quarter, yes, but for, for the first... In fact, that's for the quarter. For the quarter. And, yes. and for, the, for the first half, if I'm not mistaken, they've actually um, done around 1.7 million ounces. So yeah. they are on target, for actually, the, for the... For, for well, the, that's for the, the half, but for two half, quarters, yeah. will be, it should be two million. So it should be a million per quarter. That was their target. 
Um, They've changed the target <laughs> subsequently, I'm sure about that. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is that it's, it's becoming more and more difficult to mine. The costs are, are increasing yeah. and they, like I've said, they're trading on extremely high multiples. More difficult to mine in South Africa because it's deeper, but globally, in fact, the operations are open, uh, open pit mining. Open class mining, quite fascinating. But it doesn't seem I'm going to convince you. I'm trying to play devil's advocate here, <laughs> if you're wondering. Iron hot Fine. or not? Uh, not. I'm, uh, I back human innovation and I'd rather invest in technology stocks and, and that banks. kind of thing. Simon, yeah. hot or not? Uh, if you've got to buy, uh, notwithstanding, I can see Jonathan's, I understand it, I buy everything there. I think for a short term squeeze to 130, entirely possible. Oh. Something to invest entirely in. Entirely possible for you to do that. I wouldn't buy a gold squeeze. stock. I would never buy a gold stock. Okay. No, no, I, I, have, I have rules against that. Um, but I, I, I'm not discounting what Jonathan says. As an investment case, if you like gold, buy gold. Jonathan. I like the stock, but uh, again, investing you, when, you, when you're investing in a gold stock, uh, predominantly in South African mining stock, you've got to take uh, into consideration where the rand is going. So obviously with a stronger rand, if, even with a stronger bullion price, you're not going to see the stock move. Yeah. But as soon as the rand starts weakening, you are going to see and the And hey, we've actually started move. weakening Correct. above seven. So Thank I you. like it.